Well, good morning. It's good to see you. It's been a beautiful Sunday morning so far. We're excited uh, to be together today as we continue in our series of Summer in the Sun. And we'll be reading from Matthew chapter 25, verses 1 to 13, of what Mark uh, read for us in our communion meditation. Now, it's probably this time of the day you've already looked at your phones or your watch or, or maybe you even have an old school calendar hanging up in your kitchen. And you know that today is August 1st. Now, I know we still got some summer ahead of us, but I don't want to be the bearer of bad news. When you get into the month of August, uh, what does that mean? Schools is around the corner, isn't it? So for our students that are listening in today, hey, you got just a couple of weeks to live it up before school starts. And for our parents, I don't want to raise the uh, anxiety level for you thinking about morning routines with packing lunches and getting kids out on the bus on time. But hey, it's coming. And uh, you know what? As we think about the summer here and the life of our church, we've been extremely blessed in a variety of different ways. But especially when we think about the, the next-gen ministry of our church, the kids and students. We've had an incredible summer this year. We've had kids and students go off to different camps, go off to Round Lake Church Camp. We've had middle school students that have gone to CIY Mix Summer Camp and the high school students, CIY Move. We've had kids and students give their lives over to Jesus and be baptized this summer. That's awesome. You know, God has been working, and again, a variety of different ways of our church. We're excited for the fall, but we want to take time to, to pause and celebrate what God is doing this summer. We've had our VBS on Sunday nights during the summer, and again, just being able to see kids each and every week and watch them run around, smile, and hear about Jesus has been incredible. We want to provide some type of capstone to our summer and our church calendar for our next-gen ministry. In a few weeks, uh, just a few weeks from today, on August the 15th, we will have a next-gen Sunday where there will be some elements of our service where there will be some kids and students involved. And we'll have our very own Jack Bryan, who was playing uh, bass guitar for us today. He just graduated from Olentangy Orange. And he'll be going to Johnson University this fall. Johnson is one of our Bible colleges. He's going there for preaching and for biblical studies. And guess what? On August 15th, Jack is going to preach. He's going to preach, and we're looking forward to that, to have a graduating senior going into his freshman year of college to preach that day. So make sure that you are with us on August the 15th, and then that evening we'll have our VBS celebration. You know, as summer begins to wind down, we are still in our Summer in the Sun series. And to think about being in the book of Matthew, really when we think about last summer and this summer, we will have dedicated six months to going through one book as we talk about the gospel, the ministry of Jesus. Last week, Tom shared our care minister preached out of Matthew chapter 24, and he talked about the reality of the second coming. The certainty of the second coming. And I hope you see this. I hope you see this in the Word of God. I hope you see it in the preaching of the Word of God. I hope you can sense the intensity level in Jesus' words raising with his disciples. He's on this Mount of Olives with his disciples in chapter 24 and 25. And when we get to 26... We'll see that we are just a few days from the Passover meal. Just a few days from the Passion events and the life of Jesus. And I hope you can sense the intensity of what Jesus is saying to his disciples in these final days together. It's like Jesus knows. Hey, this is the fourth quarter of the game here. This is where it's going to really matter. Jesus tells them some things that will happen. That these man-made buildings that you see will one day fall. That you will face hardship. That you will face struggle. That you will face defeat. That you will face opposition. That you will feel like the weight of the world is pressed up against you. Does that sound familiar? You know, sometimes in our lives we face that, don't we? We face struggle. We face defeat. We face opposition. But Jesus' words to his disciples are the same to us. He says, do not lose hope. 
Jesus promises his disciples, he promises us that he will be with us in spirit. But not only that, as he promises that he will return for us. You know, there's many promises in God's word that we see where Jesus makes to us, and Jesus is always good on his word. And his promise to return again will happen. How it will lead, the events leading up to this, we can speculate, and I know there's probably differing opinions around here. But one thing we can know for certain is that Jesus will come again. You know, as Jesus ascends into heaven in Acts chapter 1, he commissions his disciples in verse 8 of Acts chapter 1, and then verses 9 through 11, we read those last week. Talked about the ascension of Jesus. Jesus ascends into the clouds, and then the disciples are standing there looking up into the clouds. And there's a man, perhaps an angel, comes to them and talks to the disciples and says, Hey, what are you doing? Why are you staring up in the clouds? Why do you have your heads in the clouds? Let's, let's get moving here. There's ministry that needs to be done. There's life that needs to be lived. The gospel needs to be taken out to the ends of the earth. People need to hear about the good news of Jesus. The man says, Jesus will come back again in the same way that he has ascended into heaven. Coming down on the clouds. Church, we're told in God's word that there will be a day when Jesus will be coming down on the clouds And there will be no confusion about what is happening. Everyone will know. Every eye will see him. Every ear will hear him. That Jesus will be coming to earth in all of his splendor. We're told that he will be coming and trumpets will be blaring, declaring that the coming of the Lord for his people. There will be rolls of thunder. Lights will fill the sky. Jesus will be coming back to earth. And we are left with this question. Are we ready? Are we looking forward to that day? And in the midst of this, whether we see Jesus upon his return or upon our last breaths here on earth, Jesus gives us here at the end of 24 and into 25, some parables of what it looks like to be ready. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus says this, starting in verse 42, he says, Therefore keep watch. Jesus says this phrase multiple times in this final discourse. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this. If the owner of that house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch. And would not have let his house be broken into. So you must also be ready. Circle that in your Bible. You must also be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. What does Jesus ask of us? He asks us to be ready. In our current culture, we've kind of come up with some systems in our lives so we can be ready for the unexpected. We try to prepare for the unexpected, don't we? Think about all the the structures and systems that we have in our lives. Think about all the insurances that we have. Think about the liability insurance or the homeowner's insurance or whatever type of insurance that we have. We try to prepare for the unexpected. Perhaps we have emergency funds set aside in case something drastic happens in our homes or to our cars or something. We can fall back on that because we want to prepare for the unexpected. If you're living on the coast of Florida, what? It'd be good to have hurricane insurance. Prepare for the unexpected. I mean, we even back up our computers to servers and other places of of hardware memory so that if our computers die, we have all of our files, all of our important documents. By a show of hands this morning, how many of y'all back up your phones? I hope there's a lot. I hope you guys back up your phones because tell me, tell me there's not a worse feeling in your phone dying. And you go to the phone store and you got to get a new phone. They're like, all right, when's the last time you backed this thing up? Uh, I didn't know I was supposed to. And then you lose all of your photos, you lose all of your contacts, and you got to start all over. We try to prepare for the unexpected. And then there's certain things in life that come that kind of catch us off guard. 
And a few weeks ago, I went down to uh, my parents' home in southern Ohio, in Portsmouth, Ohio, where we were having a family reunion for uh, my mom's side of the family. Her uh, brothers came in, her cousins and uh, her aunts came into this family reunion and they got some cabins down to Shawnee State Park. And we were going over there one Saturday to, uh, to celebrate and just to get to see some people. And I don't know if you remember back to the early parts of July that we got some bad thunderstorms. Do you remember that? I mean, some bad ones came through. Well, we were going to my parents' house just to pick up some food to take over to the park for this family reunion. And it was raining a little bit. And we pull up in the driveway and our kids are asleep. So I tell Meredith, hey, just hang out here in the car. I'll run in real quick, get the food and bring it out and then we can just go. Well, I go into the house and by the time I get in the house, it is downpouring. I mean, it's raining hard. And my grandparents on my dad's side, I don't want to confuse you here. My uh, grandparents on my dad's side are living with my mom and dad as they're providing them care. I walk in, my grandpa, who's 91, is having his afternoon cup of coffee. I was pouring down the rain. I'm like, I'm just going to sit down here and drink a cup of coffee with grandpa. As the storm comes in, and there's nothing like a July thunderstorm, is there? As the storm comes in, we start hearing the, the thunder, start seeing some lightning. And I look out the window, drinking this cup of coffee, and I see this power line snap from this telephone pole. And all of a sudden, electricity goes out. And it was a hickory tree that fell in the yard on the power lines. And boom, the electricity goes out. And then we start hearing some other trees starting to fall. I mean, it was a bad storm. I finish up a cup of coffee. The storm passes through. I go out to the van and Mary says, where in the world have you been? <laughs> You're going to leave your wife and kids in the car with the trees falling all over the place? <laughs> Fellas, I was at that point in marriage, and some of y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like, do I tell the truth and get in trouble or do I lie and get in trouble? You know, it's a lose-lose situation. There's certainly weightier things in life that catch us by surprise. More so than a thunderstorm. The unexpected phone call that we get. The unexpected doctor's diagnosis. The unexpected job loss. See, there's some things in life that you can prepare for, and there's just some things you cannot. But church, please, please follow with me on this. One thing that we can be certain of, one thing that will happen, one thing that is a guarantee is that we will see Jesus. It's going to happen. Either upon his return or upon our last breath, we will see Jesus. Jesus asks us in this time to be ready. He goes on to explain what it means to be ready in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Matthew 25, verse 1 starts out by saying, At that time, again, that's on the hills of Jesus talking about the certainty of his second coming. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins. Think of the term bridesmaids. We'll talk more about that in detail in a moment. Who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish. And five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps, but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. In this parable, Jesus is using the earthly description of a Palestinian wedding to describe what it means to be ready. Now, personally, I've kind of been in this wedding circuit lately. We had a, a, a wedding last weekend from a, a couple in our church. We've got another one coming up this weekend, another couple that has deep connections to our church. Last weekend's wedding, it was, you know, this beautiful godly couple that uh, they're young. They met while they were in high school here at the church. They went to two different high schools in the community, met here in the church youth group. I remember one summer we were at Honduras and we were on this youth mission trip and I look back in the van that we're using to travel around the country and I see these two sitting beside each other, just getting to know each other a little bit. And then a couple of weeks later, we go to see how I move and they're hanging around each other all week. 
And by the, you know, that time, they're starting to date. Well, last week, they're married. Now, if you're a high school student listening in today, I think it would serve you well to be a part of our church youth group. <laughs> I'm not saying, but I'm just saying, you know what? And then uh, this week, another uh, bride that has deep connections to our church. But when Meredith and I go to these weddings, we ask ourselves this question. Okay, if we were to get married again, what would we do different? Have you ever asked yourself that? You know, if you'd get married again, well, you know, what, what would you do different? Would you pick out different colors or would you get a different suit? What would you do different? I know exactly what I would do different. I would go up to Meredith's dad, Dennis, and I'd say, hey, Dennis, whatever you got planned for the wedding, whatever you got budgeted for the wedding, uh, how about this? Just take 80% of that and give it to us in straight cash, all right, and we'll elope. You don't have to worry about the other 20%. We'll take the money and run. Some of y'all would say, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean, there's people, let's be real, there's people at your wedding you probably hadn't even seen or talked to since the day you got married. So let's take the money and run. Whatever you might do different or whatever you've planned, Jesus uses a description of a Palestinian wedding. Now, these weddings were kind of threefold. Now, they, the wedding ceremony would take place in the bride's house. Now, before they were even uh, married, they were pledged to be married. Maybe you can think back to the birth events of Jesus, Mary and Joseph. They were pledged to be married. If Joseph, when he talked about divorcing uh, Mary quietly, why? Because this, this engagement, this pledge to be married, it was law binding. It's a lot more significant than our engagement process today. And then they would have the wedding ceremony. It was probably a little bit more intimate with just you know, close family there in the bride's home. And then you had the term, the 10 virgins here, which yes, signified their purity, but also that they were attached to the bride. They were bridesmaids. And what they were responsible for doing was illuminating this path from the bride's house to the groom's house. The wedding would take place at the bride's home and then the wedding banquet, the celebration, the party would take place at the bridegroom's home. And oftentimes it would happen at night. And so they got these, these lamps, these torches to provide, you know, this great scenery. As people from the town, the, the neighbors would come out and they would celebrate the bride and groom being married and watch them on this journey walking to their party at the bridegroom's home. It's kind of like the modern day, this, you know, the processional lines that you might see at a wedding where it's at nighttime and maybe they have some sparklers. And it looks good in the photos, doesn't it? Well, this is nighttime and they got these lamps. The Bible tells us there were five foolish bridesmaids and five wise bridesmaids. What separated the two? The five wise brought their lamps. Yes, it had oil in the lamp, but they also brought a jar of extra oil just in case something would happen to be prepared. The five foolish said, okay, we're just bringing the lamps that we have with the oil that is in them, not prepared for anything that might come. Now, Jesus says in verse 6, talks about this delay. Follow along with me, Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 6. It says, at midnight the cry rang out. Here's the bridegroom. Come out and meet him. Then all the virgins woke up and trimmed their lamps. The foolish one said to the wise, give us some of your oil. Our lamps are going out. Verse 9, no, they replied. There might not be enough for both of us and you. Instead, go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. But while they were on their way to buy the oil, the bridegroom arrived. The virgins who were ready went in with him to the wedding banquet and the door was shut. Later, the others also came. Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly, I tell you, I don't know you. And then a phrase that Jesus has repeated multiple times with his disciples in these final two chapters here of 24 and 25. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. The bridegroom came. And for the five foolish bridesmaids, they were caught off guard. They were not prepared. 
and it was too late. You know, I can think of another time in Scripture where the door was shut. You know, the, the five foolish bridesmaids, they come knocking on the door. Hey, let us in. Let us in. And the bridegroom says, I do not know you. Another time in Scripture where there was this door shut, Jesus even references it in this discourse with his disciples in Matthew chapter 24. He says this in 24, starting verse 37. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving away in marriage up until the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. That is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Just like in the days of Noah, when the door was shut, it was too late. Now, if you remember back with me to the account in Genesis, when Noah and his family enter the ark and all the animals that God prescribed with them enter the ark, who shut the door? The Lord shut the door. And for these five foolish bridesmaids, the door was shut and it was too late. Jesus concludes this parable by, by saying, therefore, keep watch. Therefore, be ready. We can learn something from this. We can't delay the potential of something later for the certainty of something now. Let me say that again. Don't, don't delay the potential of something later for the certainty of something now. Jesus says to be ready. Well, what does it mean to be ready? It means to be in a right standing relationship with God Almighty. It means to have a relationship with Jesus. You see, when we have a relationship with Jesus, there isn't a panic button that, that we start hitting. There isn't a panic button that goes off internally inside us when we start thinking about the second coming. There's no panic button that goes off when we think about seeing Jesus face to face because we have a relationship with him. That's what it means to be ready. And to be ready for Jesus then, whenever that might be, means to be with Jesus now. If we want to be ready for him then, we need to be with him now. You know, the blessing of being in a relationship with Jesus isn't just that we're on the right side of the door when that day comes. The blessing of being in a relationship with Jesus is that we get to live life with him today, to live life with him now. And despite how unpopular in our world and our culture this might be, there is only one way to be ultimately ready. And that's through Jesus. We read a scripture last week and I want to read it again this week and just go one verse further because it applies to our topic this morning. John 14, Jesus is talking to his disciples. Again, it's, a, it's at the end of their time together. Very similar context. John 14, verse 1 says, Do not let your hearts be troubled, Jesus tells his disciples. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I am going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. The certainty of the second coming of Jesus. Verse 4, he tells them, you know the way to the place where I am going. And I love Thomas's response here. He said, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how do we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You see, there's only one way. That's through Jesus. There's only one way to, to be where we are now and to eternally be with Jesus forever. There's only one way to get from here to there. There's only one way to be ready, and that's through a relationship with Jesus. 
There's not multiple ways and it's, it's all going to pan out. No, there's, there's one way and Jesus says, I am the way. And the way to be ready is to know the way to get there. And the only way to get there is through Jesus. So a question that, that we have to ask ourselves is, am I ready? Am I ready? Am I living life with Jesus? Have I given my life over to Jesus? Have I said, Jesus, I want you a part of my life. I want you in my heart. Jesus, I don't want to carry this sin anymore. I want forgiven of this. Have we given our lives over to him in baptism? Are we walking with Jesus now? That's what it means to be ready. Now, I used this illustration a few years ago in a sermon. I'm going to use it again today because it, it pertains to what we're talking about. I told you earlier that my mom's side of the family uh, got together earlier this summer for a family reunion. We try to do that with her side of the family each summer. And the reason why they put such an importance on this is because the, the patriarch and the matriarch of the family is no longer living. My mom's parents... My grandma and grandpa all passed away. My grandpa did seven, eight years ago. My grandma just did a few years ago. We called her a nanny. And I shared this uh, a while back. And uh, when my nanny had died, my dad was doing the funeral. And he knew, him, he knew my nanny and my grandpa really well. And he was going through her Bible uh, leading up to the funeral just to thumb through it in preparation and he saw something in the front cover of her Bible that she had written down, perhaps from a sermon that she had heard. When I shared this a few years ago, a friend of mine heard this in the sermon and made this frame and printed out what she had written down. And I got it in my office on a bookshelf. And this is what she wrote. She wrote, walk with him here so you can walk with him there. Think about those words. Walk with Jesus here so you can walk with him there. Jesus promises that he will come back. And it's for people that are waiting, ready for him, living life with him. The author of Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 9, 28. says, he will appear a second time. Not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who what? Who are waiting. To those who are ready. We can be ready for Jesus then by living life with Jesus now. Are you living life with Jesus? If you would like to know more about what that means, I want to encourage you with this. Don't delay don't be caught without any oil in your lamp. Don't delay the potential of something later for the certainty of something now. If you'd like to know what it means to give your life over to Jesus, if you'd like to have help taking the, your further next step, come down after service. I'd love to talk with you about that. We have people from our prayer team that would love to talk with you about that. But what it means to give a life over to Jesus and to live life with him. Because if we want to be ready, Jesus says, be ready. If we want to be ready for him, then we need to live life with him now. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And the irony of this whole thing is that you are waiting for us to turn to you. Where you don't greet us with judgment, but you greet us with open arms and grace poured over all of us. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for providing the way to life. Lord, I do pray this. I do pray if there's someone here that maybe they just don't know if they're ready. Because they haven't given their life over to you. Let your spirit work in a way that they can respond to your love and to your grace. So as we find out in your word that we can know with certainty that we are ready to see you. Only because of what you have done for us. 
It's in your name that we pray. Amen.